Um, so yeah, I'm with Adver Optical Networking. I'm a principal engineer in our advanced technology department, but I'm going to be talking today about something that's more real, more present, and hopefully more realistic. I am going to be cutting down from layer 9, as we've just had, although it was a very important topic, right the way down to layer 2. So apologies for diving into the detail. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the service life cycle, as we see it. I'll be talking about some service level agreement tools. I won't spend too long talking about standards, but I'll talk about some of the tools. I'd like to talk about some of the enabling technologies and then bring it together at the end with a hopefully one slide overview. So the life cycle, service life cycle. Um, we break our service life cycle view of the world into some building blocks, starting with planning. And this is where we believe there's a need to look at the amount of resources in the network that manage the network, report on the network. How you're actually reporting is a, is a big task. You know, how, how much data are you going to generate from managing your network? So planning is not just about putting the boxes in the right place. It's about actually equipping the network with the tools that are going to be used for reporting. Then we move into deployment and installation. And here there's a need to look at physical layer and service layer, certainly as a, as a bare minimum from our perspective. And then once we've got the network deployed and hopefully things are stable, there's a need to move into a performance assurance role. We refer to performance assurance as kind of in-service monitoring and reporting on the performance of the network. And then if things go wrong, you obviously need to go into a troubleshooting mode of operation where you can perhaps suppress alarms while you put some modes into a test routine and possibly even do some fault identification. And then finally, if you've got planned maintenance windows, you need to be able to move into those planned maintenance windows with the tool sets that you've got. So the summary of this slide is really just to say that in order to achieve a service level agreement, then you need a set of tools that enable you to complete that whole service life cycle. So what are those tools? So I'm going to start off with the very bottom layer. As I said, I'm going to delve straight into layer two. Um, we've got some Ethernet standards, one of which is um, IEEE 802.3AH. It's called, otherwise known as EFM, Ethernet First Mile. And this is a link local protocol that runs between two ports, two Ethernet ports. And it's used for some very rudimentary um, OAM tools. So if there's a power down on a box, the link partner can send you a dying gasp. You can also do, do some linked local retrieval of counters, things like that. And you can also do some port level loopbacks. Now, back in 2003, this was absolutely fine. But the, the idea of services on top of these links was starting to come to some fruition. The IEEE 802.1 guys had started rolling out their VLAN standards. And people were starting to adopt that in a wider network. So the, the need to actually start doing some connectivity management across the top of this link layer OAM tool led to the emergence of um, some things within the Metro Ethernet Forum and within the ITU and also within the IEEE. And that is 802.1ag, which is a connectivity fault management standard, and Y.1731. These two tools are actually quite similar in nature. They allow you to do some tools like the port level loopback, you can actually do that at a service layer, and you can do it within a VLAN. And it allows you to start checking that the network is working for the individual services rather than just at a port level. Once we had that deployed, then people said, OK, now I've, with my multiple services, I can now roll out the idea of having multiple priorities. And the Metro Ethernet Forum were quite instrumental in deploying or guiding people through the deployment of um, priorities within the network. For, for example, um, prioritization of voice over the top of general internet traffic. So there was a need on top of this service layer OAM, of this connectivity layer OAM, to introduce a more performance monitoring, performance management standard. And Y.1731 also achieves that. So it allows you to start introducing things like round trip times at layer two, and also the ability to monitor delay and delay variation. And you can do this on a per quality of service level. And the other thing I should point out is 
rather than just being on a linked local level, this needs to be end-to-end -end across the devices that you need to manage. Once you've got all of these nice tools in place, how do you actually deploy a service? And I, I suspect that most people have heard of IETF RFC 2544, and that's typically used for benchmarking. Um, but there's also another thing I'm going to refer to during the next few slides, which is this ITU standard, Y.1564. I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the benchmarking. Um, IETF RFC 2544 is a LAN benchmarking standard. I'm sure many of you have heard of it, but I just want to give a bit of experience from my own hand as to how we might have used this tool back in the early 2000s. So it's a widely used test methodology. Um, a lot of vendors use it in their labs to prove that the boxes are actually operating in the way that we expect. Um, so you could do throughput measurements, latency measurements, burst and frame loss. And we would typically deploy our boxes into our lab during system proving. We would run these, boxes, these tests overnight and we'd come in in the morning and see a long list of test results. And that would actually be very useful in pinpointing if you've got problems at the hardware level, memory bandwidth issues, things like this. Now, the way that RFC 2544 works, and the reason we used to make it run overnight, was because the algorithm that it is actually deploying is it tests at a maximum value and backs off until there's a pass. Because inevitably, when you start at a maximum value, you're going to exhaust the resources within the device. So it backs off until it sees a pass, and then it starts to ramp back up until it sees a fail. And that's how it starts to tune in and focus in on the benchmarking capability of the device. And a lot of people thought that was a great tool because vendors have used it, so let's deploy it out to the customer in the WAN. And I think the feedback that we've heard is that that, that is a bit of a time-consuming test to deploy commercially. Um, an average of about 20 minutes per test, if you're running a test that has multiple services, you could be running all night which is what we did in our boxes. So the other thing that it was, or is lacking, is we, we used it as a port-based monitoring tool or port-based benchmarking tool. And actually, when the <coughs> Metro Ethernet Forum advised people about the use of different services and quality of services, the problems with RFC 2544 started to become more apparent. So as an example, it, it doesn't allow you to start measuring individual um, EVCs, Ethernet virtual circuits. It doesn't allow you to start doing the packet delay variation uh, per quality of service me measurements. So if you want to actually deploy a test that is going to be commercially fast, gives you the right information that you need to manage your network, 2544 probably isn't the way to go. And that highlights the need for a new standard and that new standard is Y.1564. So I'll spend a couple of slides on Y.1564 just to try and give you an overview of what this tool is in case you've not come across it before. So the ITU developed this test in essence to try and improve on RFC 2544 and it includes two test modes. So rather than having one single test mode, it breaks it down into two. One is a very quick configuration test. It verifies very quickly if your service configuration is correct. So, for example, are my quality of service parameters correct? Can I get my service across? And that could be done in a matter of seconds or minutes. Once you've gone through that configuration test, if you want to take the testing further to benchmark, then that's something you can actually do in a second phase, and that's called the performance test. And this is where you will actually verify and actually produce a report, like we did in 2544, um, on the performance of the, the service. And this, again, rather than just saying, hey, it's going to take X amount of hours, it's a configurable thing, but typically the benchmarks are 15 minutes, 2 hours, and 24 hours. So let's take a look at the configuration test. So the configuration test is, as I said before, it's being used to verify the performance of each service. So this means we're testing the committed information rates and the EIR above that. And we want to test to make sure it meets the SLA parameters that have been set by the service manager. 
So rather than testing at the maximum and backing off, as you can see by the chart underneath here, it starts with a very low level and you can increment it up and this can be configured down to one second. So you can see how you can actually very quickly, rapidly step up through the profile so that you start to test and get some feedback as to whether your quality of service parameters are actually being met. So it tests right the way through the profile until it gets into the um, committed information right through that into the IIR and then into the red zone where we call the traffic management. Polices and shapers will actually be starting to drop traffic. So you would see traffic being dropped here, but you know that that's acceptable because that's the service that you've set. Once you've got a quick understanding that your service has actually been met, then you might want to go in and do this performance measurement test. So the performance measurement test is now, rather than saying, hey, I've got a quick measurement that I want to ramp up on the committed information rate up until a certain level, I'm now going to blast packet through my box, through my services, at the committed information rate. So I'm no longer exploring where the service is actually exceeded. I'm now blasting traffic at that committed information rate, which is the maximum theoretically for that service. And I'm going to test multiple services concurrently. So rather than testing each port sequentially, I can now actually run a test in parallel. And again, like I said before, this can be done over 15 minutes, 2 hours, 24, 24 hours, and it's configurable. So it allows you to go in and investigate the behavior of the network over a prolonged period so that you start to see the effects of diurnal activity, things like that. So what are the enabling technologies underneath that that could be used or to complement those tools? There's a need for low-touch provisioning, and this is part of the planning and deployment lifecycle. So when you plug a CPE box or an MEF NAID into the, into the network, there's a need to do some port authentication. So that is the box allowed into the network at all? And there's some Ethernet standards that do that, 802.1x. And that will actually tunnel right the way through to the radius authenticator to get some approval that that box can be used on the network. Once you've got that in place, then you can enable this 802.3ah standard, which is Ethernet in the first mile. Make sure that the, the link is up and that the link has an acceptable bit error rate, as an example. And then you can actually say, right, I want to get an IP address for my NID in, in, the, in the network. And so it'll participate in DHCP, obtain an IP address. And then from there, you can actually start to update the box automatically. So the box that's shipped by the vendor may not have up-to-date code. It may need to be modified in some way or customized by the, the operator so that there's a download software tool so that the NID can actually go off and obtain the latest um, software image. And then the other thing is that the vendors should really be rolling out are tools that enable or that um, bring the standards that I mentioned earlier together into one package. So for example, having a, a standard like Y.1731 and 802.1 AG and a few RFCs is actually useful, but if you've got to start deploying them ad hoc, how do you know actually what to do? So having the ability to encapsulate these tools into one aggregated solution, um, like a service assurance tool, is a, is a good thing to do. And this could, for example, be doing some delay measurement and synthetic, synthetic loss measurement. So rather than waiting until a packet goes wrong, you can actually say, this is the packet that I want you to drop, and I'm going to test that that packet is dropped within the network. You could also deploy some IP tools like um, ping and echo requests. Now, the need to do this is the obviously you can't just put a port loop back on. So as I said before, the idea of having... Um, reflectors at the far end that can reflect on a per service level, that's an absolute requirement to have. And then, I don't know how many of you guys are rolling out synchronization services. Um, we started seeing this from a mobile perspective, but certainly as the technology has improved, I've seen a lot of kind of financial institutions taking this on, broadcasting guys. So there are needs to take that service lifecycle out to a synchronization um, function as well. 
So it would be great if vendors are supporting, again, like a service life cycle, but for synchronization. So they need the idea of going out into the network, doing device discovery, being able to plot a map of the synchronization flow across the network is an absolute must have. The ability to start measuring the clock performance. Now this is something that a lot of people are gonna say, well, how do I do that? Well, there are some tools that you can actually use. You could digitize some of the control loops that are driving your clocks. You could monitor the variation of those clocks using those tools. And then again, if you want to actually fault find a network, you might need the ability to inject disturbances into the PLL or the clock signal so that you can monitor the effects of that. So it's a fault finding tool. Now, synchronization, okay, some of it's in the physical world, but as 1588 and some of these tools that are actually deploying phase distribution, which is actually a packet-based method. Um, the need to actually monitor packet delay variation, residence times within the devices is actually growing. So we call it a PTP network analysis tool is needed. So just bringing it all together, um, I talked at the start about the service life cycle, the planning, deployment, <coughs> performance assurance, troubleshooting, and then maintenance. And I've talked about a lot of tools. And rather than saying there's one single tool that you can start deploying, yes, Y.1564, we think is important. It cuts across a number of layers. But actually, in order to actually achieve a full service life cycle, you actually need a combination of those tools, from link layer to the connectivity fault management layers through to the service OAM. And you also need to expose the results of those tools up to the network management systems through MIBs and through our northbound interfaces. So I'd just like to finish off with a message from my side that in order to actually achieve that service level, service level life cycle, then your SLA tools um, are proven. They've been deployed in volume. They support the full life cycle, and I believe they're ready for deployment now. Could I take any questions?